alacrity which mm. this gentleman, Hyde Potter Hamlin, <laughs> also known as Rick Hamlin, does his work while he is talking on and about the topic at hand, but he's producing these wonderful pieces, which at the end all get smashed and pushed back into, <laughs> it's the greatest example of how things start out and how you see the start, middle and end and absolute decimation at the end. <laughs> so I would really like to welcome you again to our community, uh, Rick, thank you for coming this evening. And uh, we look forward to hearing what the Mounting Pot is all about. Mm. Well, thank you for uh, hosting me tonight, and thank you to the Cultural Council for sponsoring again, and thank you for coming. And um, what I'm doing as an intro to all my programs is largely to explain what I do on the potter's wheel to make a little bit of sense out of it. So my whole demonstration here is a process of pressure and motion, which is also the same process as the melting pot, pressure and motion, as we all go through. So in making a slab, for instance, the pressure against the clay by the moving rolling pin is really no different than the turning of the wheel. And this can make a simple slab pot, such as this. So you do not need the potter's wheel. You can also make coil pots which is the same technique on the, as the potter's wheel, employing pressure, motion. It's a technique that was first developed 20,000 years ago, along with pinch pottery and anvil, what's called the anvil pottery, um, striking the clay, having a rock on the inside in order to stretch it as well. There we go. To make it thin, to make it tight, you know, so it won't collapse. So a combination of coil pottery and pinch pottery, which is the precursor to what I'll be doing on the wheel. Going back 20,000 years, uh, something that uh, some assume now was something developed or at least practiced by the woman of the tribe. So the women were potters 20,000 years ago in some of the earliest pots in Asia um, and China are deemed to be suspected to be made by women potters. And this is what I'll be doing on the potter's wheel, which is pinching the clay to create a thin wall, which by placement of my fingers and my thumb I can control to bring up into a tall piece, a thin wall, and a pointy base pot, which is the most common, one of the most common shapes in the world for pottery, round bottom, flared pots. For cooking, for food storage, there are uh, numerous clays that are out there, and they change in color depending on whether it's a red clay that's got a lot of dead plant matter in it, so it would be a black clay, or, red, or perhaps it is a red clay, or it's of the yellow iron type, or perhaps it's some of the white clays that we do have here in Massachusetts. And the Algonquin did state in several of their creation stories that these colors of clay, whether they came from the ground or whether it was the result of how they fired the clay, created the color of people around the world. So the rotation of the wheel, of course, is a metaphor for change and how people look at, um, have their perspective. There was even a Egyptian, an Egyptian god who is shown on many illustrations of creating the world on the potter's wheel, which was a, created in Mesopotamia about 4,500 to 6,000 BC, and the role of the potter's wheel in Egyptian 
creativity as far as cooking wares or decorative wares or lighting was a big major influence in their in the evolution of Egyptian culture. Potter's wheel, the, the pinch pottery, I should say, can go back 20,000 years. But the potter's wheel in different forms can go back about 8,000, 10,000 years, or very simply can say that it was created 6,000 years ago in Egypt. But different wheels have developed throughout time by people throughout the world. And what they chose to make on the potter's wheel, or by coiling, or by slab, or by pinch pots, was largely affected by their environment, who they are, and how they interact in their world. The thing about the uh, pressure and motion and the rotation and the changes and yet the commonality of the pottery is always very surprising because you do have similarities in cultures such as in South America, pre-Inca, who were creating pottery without the wheel that married very well with pottery forms that were being created in the Mediterranean at this time, or even later up into Asia. And the combination of these components is no different than either the exchange of pottery throughout the world or the exchange of the potters themselves. So we, we find that cultural exchanges either improve or are rejected by some cultures. The potter's wheel was taken up by the Romans into Europe, and when Roman culture dissolved, there was a period of several hundred years where the Europeans, the Western uh, Europeans in England and Germany and France, they all rejected clay shaping and the techniques had to be restored largely through trial and error but the wheel was brought there the wheel was uh, shears a kinship with pottery kiln to make sophisticated wares but it also like with coil pots and pinch pots is not something that's required of, of for making pottery. Bonfires, pit firing are also techniques where you can harden the clay to form a ceramic um, or a pottery. So there's actually two steps that are involved with making pottery, which is the shaping of the clay and the altering of the material by heating it. So whether you're looking at this 18th century chicken, ba uh, chicken bank from Italy or something very similar that came from Azerbaijan uh, several hundred years earlier that was made on the wheel, no, I'm sorry, Iraq, that was from Iraq, or you look at the potters in South America and Latin America making very uh, similar things at roughly the same time that in Europe the potters are starting to get back to the potter's wheel. Birds were not something rejected to shape on the wheel. Any questions? You can just, if you have questions, you can just ask me. Very nice small crowd. I thought you were starting out, you were going to make a cat's face. See, now that is what is the glorious thing about pottery. Um, when I used to work in a museum, I used to correct people when they would come in. And that was an arrogant thing to do, but it also prevented me from having access to the way you think. 
So what your perspective is, is completely different because you and I don't share the same brain. And instead of rejecting the, your idea, I would say, no, it's not. Or I would just stay one step ahead of you. But that's the wonderful thing is, and that's something also when you learn pottery on the wheel, is as you shape things, you're perhaps not getting towards what you want. But if you're not open-minded enough to accept what you are creating, although it's not that particular project, uh, you lose an opportunity. And that's what I find um, is a very important with pottery, is there's an opportunity to learn something with people's ideas um, and how they, they share things with one another, if only given the opportunity. And again, that's pressure in motion. That's what's beautiful about it. Taking one idea and molding it into something else. And sometimes even the language of pottery is something that's really cool. And sometimes there are things that I just can't figure out why they were done. And this is one of them. Um, by the way, the technique is called throwing. And it's a word from the Middle Ages in England. And it's, it has nothing to do with slow, throwing the clay onto the wheel. The word was defined, it was spelled T-H-R-A-W-A-N, and the word is defined as the turn to wind or the twist. So to say you're winding up to throw the ball is repetitive. It means the same thing. So the rotation of the shoulder is the throwing. It has nothing to do with releasing the ball. Same thing with the clay. I could confuse Margaret and just say, yeah, this is a throwing demonstration and leave the room for the minute. <laughs> but we know it's a little different nowadays. So what originally was seen as a woman's occupation with coil and pinch as the potter's wheel came through and production maybe got busier. We find women potters straight through the Middle Ages. There's nothing unusual about it. And certainly more women are potters today than in the past. Um, it's a female dominated trade from the last figures that I saw. Uh, well, a good kick wheel is, a, is just magnificent um, to learn on. I think it's just the idea of breadwinner. I think that's why it, after World War II, we saw a big emergence of uh, returning vets who were going into uh, pottery making under the GI Bill. And that progressed into the 70s, and we had pottery programs everywhere. And of course, the 70s was a, was, and the 80s were a great art period. But then um, people, the market, changed to some extent and I think people's ideas of income certainly changed with the explosion in the 90s. There's a great opportunity of success in pottery making but it is something that is um, of a different lifestyle. It's not the nine to five. It's a lot like being a musician in the sense that some potters really do travel all around the world and make a marvelous uh, living that way. And others just simply want to stay in their neighborhood, per se. And whether they're more or less talented or just lucky one-hit wonders like you see in music um, is perhaps their choice or just the market's choice. But there are um, opportunities. I just think it is full of opportunities even going into the future today. Um, although it's confronted by other uh, ways of making part of making income that I think confront people differently. All right. So this simple form here is from the 15th century. 
And it was brought up originally something similar by the Romans to England and to, uh, and then it spread through the Nordic countries. And in that sense, what happened was um, use this. Yep, this works great. One, two. Using a clam uh, clamshell right now to get some of this pattern done. The one thing that always entertained me was the fact that uh, I didn't know why we had mug shots and the face was called a mug and all that slang that's associated with it and we still drink out of something called mugs. Well, apparently it's the face drinking vessels that the Romans brought up that were altered and interpreted differently and moved up into the Nordic countries where the term for a face drinking vessel was called an M-O-O-G or an M-O-G-G depending on who you read. So it was called a mug. So I'm not sure which came first, a mug shot or drinking a shot out of a mug, but um, nonetheless, let's see, and we got it's got a mustache too, so we'll do a little mustache. So you find these down in the Germanic countries too, and you find facial expressions being done on throne wares in Europe um, through the 14th century onward. Let's see, we'll cut this. And let's see, I'm just going to grab a piece of clay here. This is a communal mug, one that's meant to be shared, so it's going to have several handles on it. So it's called a, when it's got two handles on it, 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 it um, eventually will be called a love cup, and it's a presentation for a wedding or a loving cup. Um, but then we also see that it can have three handles, it can have 20 handles on it. Um, it's meant to pass around. There we go, so that goes like that. That goes like that. As far as I can tell, this is a three-handled one. And the technique of pulling the handle is no different than working on the wheel. The clay's sticky. So we have to put water on it to make it slippery, not to soften it. It's not going to soften at this point to any extent. Better not. Be a bad recipe if it was. There, two. And let's do the third one in the back. But down in Germany, they made these they do one detail, which really surprises me, and I don't know why they even bothered doing it. You can speculate that it prevents cracking on the bottom, but that doesn't hold through true. Uh, let's see. Here's that. I just think they like the effect. So, I'll take my interpretation of a 15th century moog. I'm going to pull the water out of it. But, this is what they do. They crimp the bottom. Why go through this process? I really don't know. Do you think it's just decorative? That's, you know, the simplest question, the simplest answer sometimes is it. I mean, there are people write theses on this, the dimpling. There. And that's the little bit. Yeah, I know, maybe it's lace. If you want to say it looks like lace on... But actually, this is uh, something that disappears by... Oh, I had it on the tip of my tongue. I think by the f 16th century, it disappears doing that waffling on the bottom um, technique. Is the collar at the top uh, a, a thing that's specific to the, the this mugs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is just for this one. This is a. This was one I found. 
recently, and I thought it was really neat because it had that. It, but they are common. Yeah, that's a detail that I don't recall ever seeing anywhere. It's fun. Not necessary. It doesn't help. I mean, the, in the firing in the kiln, mm. this would be stacked one on top of another. So if I'm doing that, then I wouldn't want a cup on the bottom unless it locks it in to the one below. And it's a theory. That's mm -hmm. probably another theory that could you could have fun with. I'm really not clear as to why it's done like that. And uh, actually, I'm on Facebook. I follow a group of historians who know their stuff um, in Europe. Well, they're not American-based. Well, there's a couple, there's Mary, but it's all. Cool. It's all one of those lost things. Traditions. Yep. But short-lived, like too. just tell you that um, you've had two comments. Uh, one says, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. And says, you're very talented. Oh, thank so. you. And the other comment? <laughs> there are people watching, and so it's um, a few Oh, good. No. Good. All right. Um, I make this look easy because I've been at this for 45 years, so any comparison to what I'm doing and to your first experiences, if you do this, um, should not be um, exaggerated. Um, you're going to stink at it like I did in the beginning. Just give yourself 45 years or less. It all depends on how good the clay is and how good the um, teacher is and how good the pottery wheel is. Um, like I said, I've been throwing for 45 years, and there, there was one program I was doing with some freshly purchased clay from my old supplier, and at the end of the program, my wife came up and said to me, um, you really stink, what's your problem? The recipe changed. So there are per there's personalities in the clay, and there's also, within personalities of whether you can do what you want with the clay because it's good for that, which is why there's no such thing as an all-purpose clay, um, there's also whether you feel grossed out by it. There's some clays that really lather up on your hands, like you dip them in sour cream. There are others that are gritty. Some are really past the point of gritty. They are abrasive. Um, if you find um, that you are not compatible with the clay, it's like picking up a, a musical instrument that's out of tune and trying to play something. It's just not going to work. Y y things have to be good to begin with. So, so there's two more comments. One says amazing, and the other one says he is really amazing. <laughs> Definitely hitting the high notes tonight. Well, that's heartfelt, and thank you. Thank you very much. So. Can you describe a little bit about your background and your connection to Southbridge? Oh, okay. Two. My connection to Southbridge is Harrington Hospital, <laughs> April 12, 1961. That's me and my twin sister. We were born here. My mother's side was... Uh, Southbridge uh, family, and uh, we grew up um, in part in Southbridge, but we, I grew up in Sturbridge, but the Southbridge culture was a major, major role in my life, and uh, I cannot say enough to the fact that when I was growing up, we had church and community picnics all over town, and we grew up with the ability to go to Greek picnics, Polish picnics. Albanian, Romanian, we celebrated everybody. And then in the 70s, even Vietnamese La Laotian. So it was a wonderful way of learning about people and sharing and celebration and um, eating a lot of great food. <laughs> so after uh, graduating from Tantasqua, I went to Old Sturbridge Village and with the interest of seeing if pottery was something I could do for a living. And in doing so, found out that pottery was locally made. Um, one site is Lake Syog in Holland. There's nothing unique about clay in our area. And the pottery also, the pottery history was so rich, especially going up into Woodstock, down into Woodstock, or up into East Brookfield, that 
I sort of felt really ignorant uh, that it wasn't taught when I was in school. All everything that we were learning about had to do with other pottery made around the world. But I didn't realize we were in the middle of pottery culture here, going back several thousand years. So we needed to, uh, I needed to find out more about it and share in that history as well, which I continued to do um, for, for the last decades. The, um, in doing so is when I started realizing by talking with people uh, how we look at different things as far as cookware goes, or we sh cook in different pots, or we share the different meals that come out of different pots. And then you get into what goes into the pots and you find out, well, you had the three sisters of Native American Indians, squash, beans, and corn. And these are exported out to Europe and uh, changed the whole diet out there and the whole world changed along with it. So we got the way the cook pots of the Native Americans, we got the cook pots of the Europeans. Sometimes they look alike, I'll be making those in a minute, but sometimes they look radically different, which is just as wonderful. Do you think there's been times um, in history where the objects that have been created are more utilitarian at some times in history? and then at other times more decorative or artistic um, versus the utilitarian, useful, you know, like yep. foodware type of... Well, the question of um, decorative versus utilitarian pottery has always been done, um, always been explored. Uh, uh, going to museums and seeing wonderful Greek attic pottery, for instance, makes one think that everybody in Greece had beautiful pottery, uh, which was, wasn't true. That was limited to just those that could afford it and uh, part of the certain groups that were producing it. The potters, um, so the story is going to be different no matter where you are in the world. Um, whether it's an ornate piece like I'm making right now, or a very simple piece like what you find for an Asian teapot, for instance, that's got no decoration, but the appreciation of the form is, is um, through its simplicity, is a matter of how you want to interpret the pot as well. Um, so decorative on the table versus functional or being a political statement. There are the face, these little face mugs here eventually evolve into bottles and then they stop putting what's called the Bachman on them, bearded, the bearded man. And that supposedly, according to some, had to do with Cardinal Bachman and um, having to do a statement about religion. So you also, have, and we do find that sometimes there are simple arches and lines that we see on pottery that we don't interpret today as being anything more than that, but in the time spoke of religious diversity and opinion as well. Um, so it's a very, it's, it's, there's a lot to it, there's no denying that you could take it any which way you want. Sometimes it's just the potter, like in Worcester, who was producing Norton Company, who was producing these wonderful um, stoneware jugs for holding liquids, anything from kerosene to uh, sodium silicate or water glass for preserving eggs simple pots and then they start throwing blue decoration on them 
which doesn't do anything except makes that standard run-of-the-mill jug just look a little prettier and costs a lot more to make because they were using cobalt. So the question of why that's happening too, why, why are you doing that with a jug that who's relegated to being carried to the store with you every time you want to get a jug of molasses? Because we didn't have the ability to buy individual servings to come home with. And then once you put those certain foods in there, then they're going to generally be the vinegar jug or the molasses jug. Um, all right. So we have a question, Rick, uh, from uh, somebody who is viewing, and she wants to know if we do sculptures. Cool. And Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> That's, the, that's basically what we were talking about, too, is the fact that there's an overlap. There will be a point where either the potter starts making animal forms with or without the potter's wheel. Um, Pre-Inca down in uh, Peru, the Nazca, the Mochi um, cultures use molds. As a matter of fact, the screw top lid um, was coil and pinch pots uh, made by the Mochi in 1400 AD, screw top lids, Latin America. So um, it's, it's nothing, that, there's sophistication that generally is, adapt, is, is applied to, oh, it's made on the wheel, it's got to be sophisticated. It's not necessarily true. Coil and pinch can be just as sophisticated, if not more so. Matter of fact, if you go to YouTube and look up Talking Jugs, the culture back in the 15th, 16th century, Southern Latin America going into Northern South America as the creating a uh, creation of Pots, now I'll be doing one, and I won't be making that, um, but I'll be doing a similar jug, a, a water container that's got a spigot on it. And that spigot is on both sides of the pot. And these potters decided to make the spigots look like animals. Um, whether one side, the one I'm thinking of, is a parrot's head, and on the other side it is a... Um, wolf's head. And because they put an aperture in there, when you pour out the parrot's mouth, it sings like a parrot. Uh -huh. And when you pour out, and this goes back hundreds of years, pour out the wolf's mouth, sounds like a wolf howling. It's a YouTube video. It's, it's remarkable because there are potters that are still practicing this. They are not wheel made. And people say, oh, the porcelains of it. This very beautiful, sophisticated pottery that was coming out of that area at the time. And what's it, is it a ceremonial jug? Is it a simple water jug? How am I supposed to look at it? Of course, they always apply it that it's ceremonial and special. But on the other hand, I try not to use seconds all the time at my house. I like to make something nice for my, for us to use occasionally, so. So would you just like to mention uh, your website? Uh, so if anybody wanted to see your work or to see finished pieces, which we won't see completed tonight from... Except for this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. But, uh, yep. If you All right. Mention. All right. So because I worked at a local museum and fell in love with the history of pottery made on the potter's wheel that was brought over by the Europeans, um, and practiced in this area, uh, I am and using red clay out of the ground. Um, I'm generally called a redware potter or an earthenware potter. And our websites, um, which there are several of them, we have one main door and it's called American Redware, American, R E D W A R E dot com. And American Redware is. Um, going to give access to 
my wife's site because she decorates pottery. Oop, I made it too thin. I was yakking too much. So that shouldn't be slumping, but we'll live with it. Um, oh, wait a minute. I know what I did wrong. I did this backwards. So we're going to take that. We're going to do that. This goes here. So American Redware. AmericanRedware.com is our website. Yeah. And um, it goes to my site, which is Pied Potter Hamlin. And I do more simple stuff. My wife's a graphic artist by training, and she does some wonderful scratching through a layer of white clay called Scraffito, which this is not Scraffito. Can you just hold it? So she does Scraffito work. Yeah. And um, I tend to do more simple stuff. And in doing so, we, um, we have those three websites up as well as websites for our programs. And we tend to sell all around the, um, uh, we were able to ship all around the country with our work. But we do have a shop in Warren as well. Can people come there and? Well, so they should make, make an appointment, yeah. Make an appointment. Yeah. There we go. So, so do you yeah. think there's an uptick in interest in uh, hand-created hand crafts and the ancient crafts, or do you think that there's a tapering off? What's your experience? I think the over 40 crowd is getting very interested in it. I think the up to 25 crowd doesn't know what they want to do with it. Uh -huh. So they haven't experienced it to any great extent yet. And that is the um, um, question is, where will it go in the future? Uh -huh. Now, on the other hand, what I have to say, too, is because I research old redware pottery and I've looked at the way things have sold through the years um, on the market, it appears that every time we come across an anniversary of the Revolutionary War, people want to start doing handcrafts again. Uh -huh. So we're coming up to the anniversary in 2025, although nobody's really talking about it. Um, that's why we had the, also the big burst in the 1970s. There, put the handle here. So the question was, did you say Warren? And yes, yes. Warren, Massachusetts. I should I put that too tall here. Get over there. So this is sagging a little bit. I should be putting to it a um, at least a blow dryer or a torch. But I wanted to at least give you the idea of thrown components. Whoop! I lost that one. Usually it stays up. So I'm losing this one. But it would be a bottle. That would look like this chicken. But it's not standing up. I could have made it thicker and faked it out, but usually it doesn't sag on me. But lo and behold, that's what happens. So you just grab another lump of clay. Do it again. So does the like ambient temperature affect? No, I think I just made it too thin while I was talking. I probably should have left it a little thicker. And... Uh, or brought a hot gun, a heat gun, or a blow dryer and stiffened it up a bit. But usually I make those a little thicker. For the chicken's head on this, um, that uh, is also, on some cases, that would also be the spout for pouring out the uh, contents. That's a ring bottle, and the ring bottle is again another pot that was made by coil and slab in the. Um, in South America by many potters. So let's see if I hopefully won't drop this one down, but it happens. I don't this is a, a little embarrassed, but I really am not because that's what I think hopefully inspires people to realize that sometimes these things happen. Mm -hmm. So actually I have a question. Yes. If you were doing the ring bottle um, by coiling, yep. you would make a coil very, very long coil and then roll it around this way? Um, how would you do that? 
I would suspect, and I'll show you the example here, which is this example here. That's probably a combination of pinch and coil, if not anvil too. Mm -hmm. Whether he did circular rings or whether it was flat down and the wall was brought up that way, I'm not sure. This culture though is known for also using molds. So I suspect now that I look at it, I suspect that they probably had a mold that they put the slab of clay into, just like laying pie crust in a pie pan and doing it that way. Yeah. I could also use something that resembles a Play-Doh factory or a pasta maker, an extruder for pushing the clay through and making coils that way, or I could just roll coils out. Yeah. All right, we got that. We got two. This won't be very tall, so. This probably should go on a thicker pot, but let's see where we go. Looks like that. And again, I'm going to make two parts of this. There. lean down into it. There. All right, now we bring it up. a cup shape. Now on the wheel, one only needs to form three items and then everything is created from that. So you make flat plates, you do a funnel shape or V shape, flared shape, and you do the like a bowl or somewhere in between like this. And then you also have cylinder. And between the three of them, you tend to make everything else. So when I was going over the project today, I saw something I didn't see before, which was really thrilled me. I always taken these guys separately, these two projects. I'm going to do a Greek amphora, and the amphoras were used in ancient Greece and Rome and by the Mesopotamians for storage and sometimes they were made so big that you could stand a person in them. The potter's wheel was a, would be something that would be a two-person operation. You dig a hole in the ground and have sticks protruding from a heavy stone up on top could weigh up as much as 250 pounds that would be on a pivot. And 
and in doing so you can throw different sections of the lodge in four and then put them together. Because the shaft, because the heavy stone was up on top, that was uh, only required one pivot point. It's when they put the, uh, in the Iron Age, when they stuck the shaft, the steel shaft on, that you're able to put a small disc on top and have the momentum on the bottom. That's when we start getting into the kick wheel and in, 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 uh, In about 4500 BC. So how did they acquire the uh, amphora when they had that huge structure to dry? Well, <laughs> large vessels are also made down in Mexico and um, by other cultures as well. And in doing so, without a kiln, they're simply stacking the pots on top of one another, and then there we go. placing broken pottery around them as well to protect them from some flame so they don't heat up too much. And this pit firing is a practice that was also done here in New England, but the, the functional pots that were being made here don't tend to be more than a gallon and a half or two gallon in size as far as archaeological evidence has shown. But as people decided that they got tired of building this type of kiln, or I should say pit fire, and they realized that as they put the broken pots on that it was also helping hold the heat in, they would build ovens of rock with channels in the bottom to let the heat pass through, eventually building those kilns out of brick made of the same clay. And this would allow the temperatures to increase uh, in the kiln, something that developed more so there's two ways to look at it. In ancient Greece, they were able to control the atmosphere, just like the Native American Indians down in the southwest were able to con control the atmosphere of the pit firing. So basically, whether you're in Greece or whether you're in, in the southwest, you're looking at pottery that... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, let's see, I want to go up a little bit more. You're looking at pottery where they mix the clay sometimes with urine, sometimes with uh, wood ash. They mix the clay so that it would separate and you get this very fine powder that you can then paint the pots with. It's called terra sigillata and terra sigillata is a very tight coating when you paint it on the pots. So you put the pots in the pit fire, you put it in the kiln, and um, smoke the dickens out of the pots, and then allow air in. The fine clay would hold the carbon from the fire and retain a black color. And the red clay, being more porous, would give off the carbon, uh, hold in the ox draw in the oxygen, and turn red again. So that's what we call the attic wares of, of Greece. And the attic wares of Greece, or whether the Southwest American Indian pottery was sophisticatedly controlled by the amount of smoke or oxygen in the kiln. So what I'm saying is that kilns sound more sophisticated. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with technique. And you can explore so many different techniques. So this is an amphora. 
with a base like this. But now, so this was the Greeks shared it with the Romans. The Romans trudged it up, brought it to England. Romans left England, and uh, cultures up there said, we're not going to pay attention to what you guys taught us because we don't like you. And it took a couple hundred, about three, four hundred years for them to restore the technique. And then a few hundred years after that, potters in the 1600s started taking this in for a shape again. Let's see. And let's see. And attached a little handle over here. Now these handles are going to fall off. I'm not attaching them any more than I need to stick to the piece. Then we got this bowl shape that we had before. That goes over here. Uh, this goes here. Now this is one of those pieces that goes back to your question, as well as the, the viewer. Do you do sculpture? And uh, that's what's wonderful about these. That's what I love about these. Let's see if that goes. Okay, come back here. Let's do that. So I'm going to bring that down. There would be a coating when this is stiffened up and it is flexible, like a piece of uh, somewhere between American cheese and a piece of stiff leather, you can paint the pots. If I were to paint them right now with wet, watered-down clay called slip, I would be softening the surface even more. And we all know what happens to too soft of a surface. It doesn't stick around too long. There. All right, so we got this. Here's my show. Here's my show. And in this case, I'm using a, a regular shell again to do the pattern. As in the case of most pottery, pointy sticks and shells and things of this sort are commonplace no matter if you're in Eastern Europe or in Africa, no matter where you are, we tend to find the most simplistic tools are also hold the most potential for decoration if we pay attention. There we go. Could have put this on if I wanted to before. Could have left it on this piece, but I'll just do it now. I have to believe the original didn't suffer breakage. So the amphora shape turned into a drinking jug in the 1700s with a mug that you'd be drinking out of that would fit right on top. Hope it looks like an owl. And you do find them. They also make them out of, uh, make them look like bears and stuff like that. Another so wonderful bear that's over here. And that's a, practically the same shape as the M4 that I just made. Mm -hmm. So adaptability. Taking something perhaps they didn't like and then turning it around and making it into something mm -hmm. rewarding for them. Common tableware, well, they call this tavernware. It's not going to last too long in most of the taverns that I'm thinking of. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe it was done for the lord of the, uh, of the land just to impress him or to help pay off some debt. Who knows? Who knows how that works out? There we go. All right. Any questions? No questions? I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, all right. So this is Middle Ages to 1700s. 
I think a lot of what we uh, find in many cultures for the decorative wares throws us off because uh, we don't, I don't really know whether they were truly that commonplace. Back in the 1980s, I read of a potter in Italy. This one's a little too stiff. And his, um, the article in Ceramics Monthly called him the last chicken potter in Italy. And it had to do with the same situation that I learned of later on. His lament, it's still a little stiff, his lament was that people enjoyed convenience. And then with enjoying convenience, they were forsaking the pottery that was traditional. So his picture that looked like a rooster, once he uh, stopped making them, they ceased to be made. And the same holds true for this piece here, which I've made before here, but I like making it because it's so confusing. Um, for people to witness. But it also made its tracks from the Middle East, going back 4,300 years, I believe, is the date, <clears throat> only to be resurrected when witnessed in the mid 1780s, 1700s, I mean when the tea drinking craze hit England. There. All right. And it was brought back to England and these pots were being made out there. So it is a, not necessarily a teapot, it's a hot water pot because most Herbal drinks are made in the cup. But this was a popular piece up until probably again the 1970s because I confronted a, a gentleman at a Middle Eastern bakery and asked him if he was familiar with this piece. And he was in his 30s, young 30s. He didn't have a clue what I was talking about. So I had to go about three or four different ways of describing it. And then he acknowledged that he did know of it, but he considered it to be the old people's teapot. And uh, that's because they went to the store and they bought metal ones. So like the chicken pitcher, this piece basically has gone into history as made by potters. It's called a samovar, which is, uh, we're familiar with the Russian samovars for tea, but its name actually goes to the Middle East. And it means to self-cook. So the ones that they found in Azerbaijan were very old and uh, had all the indication that the smoke went up the center tube. There we go. One, two, three. All right, got that one there. Let's put you back. So like the ring bottle that I had made earlier that collapsed, this is also a two-walled pot. I should have mentioned that ring bottle went through a lot of changes through time as well. And the 
ancient Egyptians used them as perfume bottles. And they also had multiple spotted ones with cups that they could choose to drink out of any cup that was supported by the ring horizontally, not vertically as I had it positioned. Now there are other things that have been made in the past too by potters that you wouldn't think were related to our trade because we generally thought of just making kitchen wares. But in the old churches in England and maybe even earlier going down into southern Europe into the Middle East, you find that in the stone walls that they put up, you find these bell shapes just being buried in there for amplification to increase the sound. There was another uh, instance of, I was reading about this morning, because somebody posted it, horns being made on the potter's wheel. Trumpets, in other words, for shepherds, because they were cheaper. And that was supposedly a very common thing in France. And of course, you got drum bases that are made out of clay. And have traveled to help express people throughout the world. Now, by right, this would be getting a hole right at the base here, right above the base, and then the spout would be attached. So this goes here, right above the hole. This goes like this, and this climbs way over the top. So this is the Azerbaijani samovar, and then the handle goes over here. Fill up with water, heat it, put it on the fire. Fill it through the spout, and then... That's what's wonderful about pottery. Our perceptions of whether we need a cover, because there's no hard set rule that you need a cover. Is there, is there a hole? Or you have to fill it from the bottom. So when you fill it from the bottom, the inside tube retains the water. The water will rise up until it flows out of this tube, which you then flip over because this tube is higher than the water level that locks it in. And then you put it on the fire, and the outside and the inside of the pot heats up all above the fire. Hmm. Hmm. I'm having trouble following this. Let's, let's run through that again. OK. Would it be easier if I show you the inside? Yes. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. So when you flip it upside down and pour the water in, it's going to fill the chamber until it gets to the hole at the spout, which will then, you know you're full because it's running out the spout, so then you invert it, and the water will be trapped right above. It won't go down, won't go back down because of this hmm. tube. And it won't go out because the height of the water is lower than the height of the spout. Interesting. <coughs> very, very, that's, that's an intriguing design. Yeah. And it, 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 that's why I like doing it, is because yeah. it's just totally mind-numbing. So. Yeah. And yet, these were used up until the 1970s and 80s, and they were very commonplace. There was an article in one of them, just like the same magazine that had the article about the Potter who uh, wasn't making chicken pictures, same thing. Last potter making these. So. There are still some very traditional things, oil lamps being produced constantly, whether they are, uh, we think of them, and I'll show you the oil lamp. The oil lamp is very easy, and that gets back to our simple form again. It's a matter of adaptability. It's a matter of pressure, motion, adaptability. That's what I love about it. This is used in India. It is in the uh, 
Diwali, the Diwali ceremony where they float lights mm -hmm. down the Ganges. Very simple. I'm not going to make it bigger than it needs to. Very simple oil lamp. So at least these culturally have been retained. Bean pots, depending on the culture you're in. The Boston bean pot that we're familiar with is basically gone. Um, I used to sell a lot of them in the 80s. Um, now they're relegated, I think, to the crock pot, which really is unfortunate because they cook. I didn't know this. Red beans actually have a toxin in them. And unless you get them up to boiling temperature for five minutes, it can give you stomach problems. So cooking it in a crock pot is too low a temperature. You got to boil your bean, red beans for five minutes. So there are photographs I have of current potters in India who are producing these by the thousands. And it looks like mm -hmm. that oil lamp. Little wick goes over here and some kind of fat goes into the bowl. And you can find this going all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia. Nothing recent about it at all. Something functional that works that hopefully won't be disappearing anytime too soon. I should have trimmed the bottom off. But. So that's your little oil lamp. And of course, fat's been used by a lot of other cultures too. Any questions? How are we doing there? Uh, there was a question about whether you paint your pots. Okay. If you wanted to. Well, one of the misconceptions is that I make pottery on the wheel. So I, I, I actually shape clay on the wheel and I have to make pottery by heating it, whether it's in a pit fire or a bonfire or a kiln. And what that does is it causes the sand uh, in the clay to become glass-like and promote a melting that will make an, an opaque glass called pottery, like what we have here. In a simple fire like the American Indians were using around here, to the more complicated down in the southwest, because they had a longer period of time to work with pottery than the New England potters did. It's about a one to 2,000 year difference, because it came down south and then we went up, supposedly. Anyway, the, uh, the clay can be painted to decorate it or to seal it. And like with the, um, the pottery here, uh, the, the uh, Greek attic ware, a simple coating of very finely produced clay that's actually denser than this pottery because of the fact that it's been treated with urine or some kind of alkaline will seal the pot. But generally it's done on a decorative basis, so it doesn't really matter. And it's done on the outside of the pot, so it's decorative, it's not functional. The American Indians down in the Southwest would produce this coating on the pot, paint the surfaces of the pots, rub it with a stone to compact the surface even more and in the pit firing get something that would be more watertight. Sometimes they even added pitch to the surface of the pots and melted it on to seal the pottery as well. Um, as we um, start getting into glass making, into kilns in the Middle East uh, and hotter temperatures, we start taking the clay and we start putting a glass coating on the pots, which if it was a typical glass coating that one would be making windows out of, it would flow right off the pots because it'd be liquid. The melting point of it would be lower than the melting point of the pots and it would just stick right down. So everything would stick together. So what one does is in the glass recipe, we add clay to stiffen the melt. So glass plus clay is glaze, and that would make the shiny surface on some types of pottery. And that was expanded into, um, explored going up into Asia with the um, 
Chinese potters on the Yellow River in Korea, where a lot of the high temperature stuff was developed before it went to China. And the, the pottery there could take a very hot 2100 to 2300 degrees versus the lower temperature stuff going anywhere from 800 degrees in a pit to 14, 15, 16, 1700 in an earthenware kiln. Uh, the pots that were in the, the, what's called the stoneware kilns in Asia could be brought to um, a glassy surface just because the wood is blowing ash and ash is glass and the glass from the ash is forming a glaze. So that's another technique. The Germans, on the other hand, in Europe, who started trying to compete with the Chinese potters, develop a technique of taking the pottery and heating it in the kiln, getting it up to a very high temperature. And whereas I take a glass coating and I lower the melting point of the glass by adding a flux, which would be potassium, sodium, table salt, for instance, or in the past, lead. You can use lithium if you want. It makes the sand melt at a lower temperature. The potters, uh, and you apply it by mixing it with water and painting it on the pots, or dipping the pots into it, or pouring it on the pots. And then you melt it in the hot kiln. The German potters found the technique of putting the pots in the kiln with no coating on them, or maybe taking the white clay that the stoneware was made out of, tinting it with blue cobalt, putting it in the kiln, and then when the kiln's really hot, you throw in table salt, and instead of a cold application of sodium and silica, the sodium in the sand attacks the sand in the clay, makes a glass coating on it that looks like an orange peel, salt glaze stoneware. So that's uh, another way of decorating the pots. So you can fire, you can, you can put the glaze on hot, you can put the glaze on cold. For stoneware potters and us earthenware potters, unless we're really familiar with our techniques, we generally like to slow the cooling down. There's no rush to turn it back into, uh, to, to restore it back to a, a rigid or hard material. But in Japan, where a woman potter, or the wife of a potter, we really don't know, removed the piece of pottery from, her, from the kiln, dropped it into a combustible material, and for me, what would have been just a nice green glaze turned into a copper glaze or a tin glaze, it um, turns white, it turns silver. These are the art approaches that we do today, but the raku technique that she developed, I think in the 17th century, uh, and that was brought to um, the emperor of Japan and gifted, turned into a national symbol of, of a particular type of pottery. So in that case, you're taking the pot out of the kiln when it's glowing orange and throwing it into something that burns and uh, creating a whole nother technique. And if, things are, if the clay is right, which would be a sandy clay, it's not going to uh, crack on you. So how do you want to decorate your pots? You can spend a lifetime doing it. You can decorate the clay surface, put the glaze on it, decorate the glaze, decorate the surface of the glaze with decals or whatever, and then you can even go above or over brush decoration. And then in the end, you can do a simple band of gold, and that would be your lowest temperature, 1200 degrees, and melt that on. It's a wonderful technique. There's just so many different things that one can do with clay that um, you can spend a lifetime doing it and find out about different peoples and from around the world at the same time and sharing all these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming. So thank Hope you, you enjoyed. to the Southbridge Cultural Council and to the Mass Cultural Council for supporting this program this evening and to Rick. Uh, Hamlin for a wonderful presentation and demonstration, as mm -hmm. we can just see over here, of how you can talk and throw pots at <laughs> which is very impressive. Thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>